So I was thinking and just praying and seeking the Lord. And this word just popped up in, into my spirit. And the way that I usually uh, prepare my sermons, and every pastor does it differently, but the way that I prepare my sermons is that God begins to give me some idea of what he wants me to speak. And usually it may be a word, it might start with a scripture, it might start with an idea, it might start with, you know, something like this. And, and this week as I was praying, then what I do is all week long I'm writing scriptures down. God's speaking to my heart and I'm jotting down little notes and writing scriptures and looking for stuff. And I've got a pad in my kitchen on my island and I, I just, you know, keep writing things down as, I, as I'm thinking about it and as God's speaking to my heart. And then usually what happens is that on Friday, uh, Friday afternoon is when I start pulling all of this together and start making it into some sort of a sermon, get some sort of continuity of thought and idea. So really, this all started with really an idea and a, a, a leading in my spirit uh, and this word, this word uh, that God gave me to speak to the church. And he was also speaking to me, but I believe that there are many of you here today that need to hear exactly what I'm going to bring forth because I believe the Holy Spirit would not lead me to do this or give me this message if there weren't people here that really needed to hear this. And the testimonies I've already gotten and said, wow, pastor, this was a word for me. All right. So this is, so I'm, I'm praying to write down the word and this is the word that we're going to talk about today. And the word is, Sandy's going to put it up behind me. The word is, you ready? You ready? Continue. One of the things that you and I have got to really see and understand is that we've got to continue. We've got to keep it up. You can't cool down. This is not the time to cool down. This is the time to fire it up. You see, there are too many Christians that are pulling, pulling back, quitting, giving up. But this is not the time to do that. This is the time to, to continue, to keep on going, to keep on doing. Can I get a better amen than that? So we're going to start in 2 Timothy and we're going to talk about some things today. But let's start in 2 Timothy chapter 3. And Paul writing to Timothy, uh, Timothy was a young pastor and um, he's encouraging him. But these words are not only for Timothy, these words are for you and for me, right? So this is what he says, verse 10. He said, but you have carefully followed my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, love, perseverance, now listen, persecutions, Amen. afflictions, which happened to me at Antioch, Iconium, and Lystra. What persecutions I endured. Now, let's just talk about this for a minute. When we're talking about the word continue, that means we got to keep it up. Paul is talking about, listen, he, he, did all, he was serving God. He was in the will of God, yet he had all of these persecutions. He had all of these struggles that came his way. Let me just say something right at the beginning. Let's just wake up, church. Let's just, let's just get right to it. Just because we're believers, just because we've got the word, we've got faith, doesn't mean we're not going to have some persecution sometime. And persecutions come in all shapes and forms and sizes. Persecutions can come from your family, can come from your best friend, can come from church people. That's the worst kind of persecution is when you get persecuted by another believer. And sometimes it's the devil himself that will come to persecute. But, but Paul said, he said, listen, he, you know, and remember what the words of Jesus said, while you're in the world, you will have trouble. He said, but take heart for I have overcome the world. Can I get a better amen than that? So he said, remember all of these things, what per persecutions I, I um, endured. In other words, he endured them. He said, and out of them all, the Lord delivered me. So no matter what the persecution was, no matter what the enemy tried or people tried, and it's all perpetrated by the enemy, you understand that. Whatever he tried, it, it failed. It didn't succeed because Paul says that out of all of these trials and persecutions, the, deli the Lord delivered me from all of them. Now, what you have to understand is that the enemy is not going to make it easy for you. If you're going to serve God and you're going to be godly and you're going to walk after the things of God, you are going to suffer persecution. There are going to be people in the world that don't like the fact that you serve God. There are going to be people in the world don't like your God talk. They don't like the way you say hallelujah, amen, and talk about God and how good God is. The world is becoming less and less tolerant. Listen, the world is becoming less and less tolerant of Christians. Watch the evening news and see how, how vitriolic the conversation is against Christians. You, you, you see, what you have to understand is we live in a day and a season, an hour where the persecution is being heightened and increased. 
But you see, in light of all of this, no matter how bad the persecution comes, you and I must do this one thing. We must continue. Everybody say continue. <laughs> Paul gives the testimony. He said, I went through all these persecutions, but the Lord delivered me out of them all. So the truth and the word for today is that no matter what you may be going through, no matter what the persecution is, no matter what a person, the devil himself, no matter what is happening to you, the promise is this, that the Lord will deliver you out of them all. All you and I have to do is to continue. So he says, he says, persecutions I endured and out of them all the Lord delivered me. Yes, and all who desire to live godly in Jesus Christ will suffer persecution. There it is. All who desire to live godly in Jesus Christ are going to serve, are going to be persecuted. People, you know, make fun of you. People think you're, you're weird. People think you're odd. People think you're, you're, you're stupid, you're sick or whatever it be. How can you think that stuff? You're going to suffer persecutions. It's going to happen. But Paul says, take heart, the Lord has delivered me out of them all. So no matter how hot the, the, the persecution becomes, what we are called to do as believers is to continue. You've got to keep it up. So Paul goes on and he says, and yes, all those desire to live godly in Jesus Christ or Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. But evil men and imposters will grow worse and worse, deceiving and be deceived. Now, one of the things that you and I have to understand is that we live in a, in a day and an age. Paul's talked about it, talking about it here. Jesus referenced it, that in the last days there would be imposters. There would be deceivers that would come. And they are among us in, in, in Christian circles. I heard a story, and this is just a little side journey, but I think it'll be of important, importance to you. I heard a story about a pastor, read an article about a pastor who had a huge mega church down south somewhere. And one day he, after many years of being in the ministry, one day he and his wife stood up in front of the congregation, announced to the congregation that he was gay. They were getting a divorce and they were going their separate ways. Church fell apart, but a group of people followed this guy. He went and started another church, met a man, got married, and, and is still pastoring in this church. Now, that's an imposter because anybody who has the Holy Spirit within him knows that that is a sinful life and that's sinful activity and that does not go with the, with the basic principles of Christianity. Anybody worth their salt, any believer will know that that is an ungodly and it's sinful. But yet there's a group of people and he created a church and it, it sounds, you know, some of it sounds Christian-like. You gotta be very, very careful. In this day and age and hour that we live, we've got to be more discerning than ever before. You, you've got to discern the difference because some of it is so closely parallel to Christianity or it seems like that it, it, it takes little portions of Christianity. But you see, even in the midst of all of this, the deceivers are going to be there. The imposters are going to be there. Those that are going to try to trick you are going to be there. Now, but, but what are we to do in light of all this? Are we to quit or are we to continue? We're to keep on going. I've heard people, uh, you know, back out of church, leave church because of imposters. Because, you know, they say, oh, you see, this is all phony. Look at that. Listen, don't put the rest of us who truly serve the living God in the same group of those who are imposters and are trying to lead people astray and doing things and fleecing people. Don't put us in the same category. Because there are a group of us that truly love God and serve God with all of our heart and only want to lead people into the ways of the truth of the gospel. You see, I don't care anymore. I just speak the truth. I don't really care if people like it, don't like it. You come, you don't come. I say to people, you come, praise God, I'm here. You don't come, praise God, I'm still here. I'm not going anywhere. So I'm going to preach the truth. I'm going to continue on in what God has given for me to do. And you ought to do the same thing. Can I get a better amen than that? All right. So he says, verse 13 again, but evil men and imposters will grow worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. Verse 14. But you must continue. Everybody say continue. continue. You must continue in the things which you have learned and been assured of, knowing from whom you have learned them. So he says here, he says, the things that you have learned and are assured of. 
How many times have I seen people get the assurance of something from the Word of God, but they don't continue in that insurance? It, once you get the assurance of the Word of God, once you know that you know that this is truth, don't just do it for a while and stop. You must, everybody say it, continue. This is where the blessing comes. This is where the breakthrough comes. This is where you, you, you grow in the deeper things of God. When you continue in what you have learned, don't forget what you have learned. See, and, and you can't just sit on what you've learned. So many times people learn it, they get it, but they sit on it. It doesn't say you're going to be blessed because you know it. It says you're going to be blessed because you do it. You know it and you're putting it into action and something is happening. He said, don't forget the things that you've learned. Don't forget the things that you have learned. Be assured of them. Listen, let me tell you what. There are some things that I'm assured of in my life that you can't talk me out of. Nobody, nothing, no thing, no person on this earth can talk me out of a couple of things. I'm assured of this, that God loves me. I am assured of this, that God loves me. I'm assured of this, that my salvation came by faith through grace in Jesus Christ that, that my, 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 this salvation that I walk in is a grace action in my life. I did, don't deserve it. I, don't, I didn't earn it. But God gave it to me anyway because I put my faith and my trust in His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. That's how salvation... I'm assured of salvation. You can't talk me out of it. I'm assured of this, that God is the healer. That God is still healing sick and broken bodies. You can't talk me out of the fact that God is still a miracle worker, that he does miracles. You can't talk me out of the fact that God is a God of great prosperity and has promised prosperity for his sons and daughters. You can't, you can't talk me out of the fact that God wants every one of his children to prosper, that God is not the author of poverty. That God is not the author of sickness and disease. God is not the author of lack, want, and insufficiency. God is the God of healing. God is the God of power. God is the God of great love. God is the God of great forgiveness. God is the God of great prosperity. You cannot talk me out of it. And people have criticized. People have talked against me. People have said things uh, that were hurtful to the core against these principles that I believe. You can't talk me out of it. I am assured of it within my spirit, within my heart. God is a God of great things. So he says, he says here, you must continue in the things which you have learned and been assured of. If you've been assured of something, don't give it up. You can't talk me out of the fact that tithing brings results. That's why I talk about it so much. Why do you think I talk about it so much? Because I've been practicing these principles. I'm assured of it. It's worked in my life. And I want to see it work in your life. He says... Continue in the things which you have learned and been assured. See, a lot of people just don't continue. And, and the fact that you don't continue is the reason why you don't see the results. Amen. The results come from sticking with it and doing it. I've been doing this for over 35 years now. Amen. Just following, obeying, believing, doing the word of God. As soon as I get the assurance of something and have all my life from the word of God, I just stick with it. I continue. I continue. Say with me, continue. <laughs> this is not the time to, to quit. What are you going to do? If you don't continue, what are you going to do? Discontinue? God has called us to keep it up. This is not the time to turn it down. This is the time to turn it up. This is the time to fire it up. Not back up, but to go forward. Come on, somebody give me a better amen than that. You must continue. Must. Notice he said must. You must do this. You must continue in the things which you have learned and have been assured of, knowing from whom you have learned them. If you had a good example and someone, you had a teacher, whether it be me or some other teacher along the way that has taught you these truths and they have proven it in their life and they're showing the fruit in their life and you've been assured of it, don't give up, don't back up. You need to practice it. You need to do it. You need to put it into operation in your life. This is the reason why some people don't make it. This is the reason why some people don't ever get to the, to the level of blessing, to the level in God that maybe they seek and desire is because you haven't continued. You've discontinued. I used to be a tither. I don't tithe anymore. 
I used to be a giver, I don't give anymore. I used to go to church every week, I don't go to church every week anymore. I used to help in the church, I don't help in the church anymore. I don't do this, I don't do that, I don't do the other thing. You've discontinued the things that you learned and were assured of in your heart. And he says, you man of God, you, you need to do this. You need to continue in those things that you've learned. And you need to keep on doing it because that's what's going to make a difference. So we need to continue. And he says, um, knowing from whom you have learned them and that from childhood you have known the holy scriptures which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. Yeah. All scripture, not some scripture, not portions of scripture, not just your favorite scriptures, all scripture. All, that means every word that's written in this book is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. Notice it says it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness that the man, and that means woman too, of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. All right. So the word of God teaches us that we must continue. So I've got a few things that I want to just share with you. I've got four things. This is not an exhaustive list, but this is what I believe the Holy Spirit wants to speak to this church. So I wrote these four things down. This is what we're to continue in. So let's talk about it. Now, this first one you're not going to like because the minute I say it, it's like a dirty word to most people. It is to me because this, this is a tough one sometimes to swallow. But, but the very first thing that we need to continue in, we need to continue in. You ready? You ready to hear what it is? The very first thing is patience. Yes. Patience. Yes, patience is what we need to practice. There are so many people, too many people that are totally impatient. And, and, and really, if we're going to get anywhere in God, if we're going to see anything truly happen, we're going to have to just get patient, be patient. Because God is working some things behind the scene that you and I may not be aware of. We all want to be somewhere. We all want to have something. We all want to see things happen. But if, we don't, if we're not patient, we're never going to see these things come to pass. So the very first thing that we need to continue, and I know some of you have been waiting a long time for, for things to happen, for things to change, for things to break open, for, you know, the answer to prayers. And, and maybe you're at the brink of almost wanting to quit. I've seen too many Christians quit. And the word of the Lord, the word of the Holy Spirit to us today is as far as it concerns patience, you must continue patiently moving forward, enduring until you see the fruit that you are seeking and desiring. So the word is continue in patience. All right. So let's go with that. We're, we are going to open to this one. Let's go to James chapter five because I want you. I'm sorry, James chapter one. We'll get to James chapter five in a minute. But go to James chapter one. And, and let's see what it says. My brethren, verse two, my brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, oh my gosh, are you kidding? When I first read that, I thought it was a misprint. I thought somebody slipped and wrote the wrong thing. What do you mean count it all joy when I fall into trials? Well, what does trials mean? Tests, temptations, and trials. Anybody been through a test lately? lately? Anybody been through a trial late, lately? Anybody been through, you know, a trial of some sort? Yeah. Right. Well, yeah, he says, what are we supposed to do when we come into these test trials and temptations? We're not to fall apart. Amen. We're not to discontinue what we know. Right. We're to continue in what we've learned. Yeah. We're to keep on going, going against those test trials and temptations. Yeah. That's what the Bible is teaching. Yeah. So we've got to continue. It's so easy to quit. And I see so many people quitting. So he says, let's keep reading. He said, my brother, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing you have to know this. You have to know this when the tests and the trials come. He said, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience, produces pa the testing of your faith produces patience. That's why we must continue on in, in patience. We are going to get, listen, listen now. Just because you're a believer doesn't mean you're not going to go through a test. Doesn't mean you're not going to go through a trial. Doesn't mean you're not going to go through a temptation. As a matter of fact, let me tell you what, this is one of the tricks the devil uses to try. Because see, his greatest desire, I want to just tell on the devil a little bit here. His greatest desire is to thwart the plan, the destiny, and the purpose of God in your life. 
So sometimes test trials and temptations will come your way. And if you're not practicing patience, if you're not staying in faith through these test trials and temptations, there's a chance that you're going to turn around and quit and give up and bite the bait of the devil. He said, let the testing of your faith produce patience. See, we don't want to talk about tests. Like, oh, don't tell me about tests. Don't tell me about trials. Don't tell me about tests. Well, listen, the fact of the matter remains that we all go through tests. We all go through trials. We all... Don't look at me here today and tell me you haven't had a temptation lately. I see it all over your face. We all get tempted. We all get tempted with all kinds of crazy things. The devil's always trying to pull us back to the life we came from. From the thoughts we used to think, the actions and activities we used to be engaged in. Come on. Don't look at me so holy this, this morning. You all know what I'm talking about. Well, what does the Bible say? When these test trials and temptations just count it all joy. Why? Because, praise God, if the devil's coming to tempt me, that means that God's got something good about to happen in my life. There's a plan. There's something that's about to break open in my life. So when the test trial temptation comes, I don't fall apart. I continue saying, praise God. God's got a blessing in store for me. There must be something big that God is cooking up because the enemy's throwing a test, throwing a trial, throwing a temptation my way to try to dissuade me, trying to get me to quit instead of continuing. That's why we must continue. Patience must have its perfect work. Let's read it. Now listen. It said, but let patience have its perfect work that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. So let's think about this for a minute. This idea of lacking nothing or having abundance is tied to this thought that patience brings forth abundance in my life. Let patience have its perfect work that you may be complete, lacking nothing. Well, let me flip it around. If you're impatient, then it would seem to me that that would bring lack and insufficiency into my life. If patience brings abundance, then impatience must bring lack and insufficiency into my life. That's why the Bible warns you. This is a warning. He's saying, let patience have its perfect work. In other words, hold down, cool your jets, baby. Don't, don't get impatient. Don't freak out. I know there are things you want. There are things you need. You're waiting for God to act here. You're waiting for this breakthrough. You're waiting for this. But cool your jets, baby. Because let patience have its perfect work that you may be complete, not lacking anything, lacking no thing. Because if impatience gets into your heart, then it's going to produce lack and insufficiency. And that is the truth. People act impetuously sometimes without consulting, praying, seeking God, taking time, allowing God to do his work and make things happen. You try to make things happen. And what happens? It causes a disaster in your life and you come out lacking instead of not lacking. So what are we to continue in? We're to continue in patience. That's what God has called. I hate that word. Because I'm the kind of guy when, when I want something, I want it done right now. I want it done right now. Can't you, can't you work any faster? Can't you, you know, you order something, they say, well, it's going to take three weeks. Oh, shucks, come on. You mean you don't have it? You can't, I can't get it today? Is that the truth? I want it done. But you see, if we're not careful, we're going to, we're going to transpose that stuff onto our, our, our Christian walk. And, and the Bible says, let patience have its perfect work. There's a perfect work in patience. God is working something in our lives. Listen, sometimes you may not be ready for what you are seeking God for. God has to do something behind the scenes. He's got some things to do. He's got to move some things around. He's got to position the right people. He's got to create the right things. He said, let, don't, don't let impatience screw up the plan and the purpose of God for your life. And I've seen so many people screw up the plan and the purpose of God because they get their hands on it. you got to learn to trust God and just be patient. Just be happy. Be content where you are. Seeking God. Believing God. Expressing your faith. Doing it patiently unto the Lord. Until God has, has the right time to bring these things to pass in your life. I know myself over many years ago, I was praying for, you know, for the church and for growth and believing God for all of this growth and growth. And I want a big church and I want to see more people and I want to have a big church. And you know what? The truth of the matter was, if God had given to me that when I first started, I'd be dead today. 
I would have died of a nervous breakdown or a heart attack or something because I wasn't ready for what I was praying for. But fortunately, I learned that lesson and patiently persisted and patiently endured step by step by step, just continued on doing what I knew to do. Honoring God, loving God, serving God, holding fast to the doctrines of faith until I gave God enough time to work the things he needed to work in order to bring me to the place that I am today. You got to let, you got to have patience or let patience have its perfect work so that you will be complete lacking nothing because impatience definitely brings lack and insufficiency into your life. You don't have to move God's hand. You don't have to move the Holy Spirit. As a matter of fact, you can't move God's hand. You think you're moving God's hand, but you can't. God wants you and I to express patience. Everybody say patience. patience. All we're to do is to continue on in patience. Can I get a better amen than that? All right. So he says, let's see. He says, but let patience have its perfect work that you may be complete, lacking nothing. If any of you lacks wisdom, ask of God who gives to all men liberally, liberally, and let him ask in faith without doubting. For he who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. And let not that man suppose he will receive anything from the Lord. Um, so he goes in verse 12, he says, Blessed is the man who endures temptation, tests or trials, or is patiently enduring these things. For when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Come on, can I get a better amen than that? Let's go over to James chapter 5. And again, James writing here, he says in, in chapter, I'm sorry, um, Paul writing in James here, he's saying uh, chapter 5, blah, 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 got thoughts coming like, like a machine gun. James chapter 5, verse 7, he says here, Therefore, be patient, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. So what are we supposed to do until Jesus comes? Be patient. Be patient. We're supposed to be practicing patience. He says, see how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, waiting patiently for it until it receives the early and the latter rain. You also be patient. Everybody say patient. Establish your hearts for the coming of the Lord is at hand. And I like verse 9. Don't grumble. Stop complaining and being a complainer and a squawker. Shut your mouth and honor the Lord. Praise the Lord. Thank God for where you are and what you have. And just continue. Everybody say continue in patience. Just continue trusting God until you see the fulfillment of your desires, wants and needs. Can I get a better amen than that? So we are to continue on in patience. All right. So what else are we to continue on? My time is going away. I can't believe it. Turn that clock back. What are we to continue in? We are to continue fighting the good fight of faith. We, we've been created by God to be fighters, soldiers, warriors. We're to fight the good fight of faith. This is what's going to bring our needs, wants, and desires. I, you, can't, you can't talk me out of the fact that faith can change your very life. Amen. Can bring the things you need, want, and desire. Amen. He says here, you know, let, let me read you. Let me read a couple of verses. Sandy will put them up there. 1 Timothy 6, uh, 12 and 13. This is what, 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 what Paul tells, tells Timothy. He says, fight the good fight of faith. What are we supposed to do? Fight the good fight of faith. He says, lay hold on eternal life to which you were also called and have confessed the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. So what are we called to do? We're called to fight the good fight of faith. Say fight. fight. See, you're t you, this, this is what we need to continue in. Faith is going to change your life. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, 7 and 8, Paul writes it this way. And he says to Timothy, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now, can you, can you say that? That you have fought the good fight of faith? Are you fighting with your faith? Are you fighting with your faith? Are, 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 are you, are you doing, are, have you kept, have, have you finished the, like, you know, are you finishing what God has given for you to do? Paul came to the end of his life and he said, I fought the good fight. I've finished the race. I've kept the faith. 
Now he says, finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day. And not to me only, but also to all who have loved his appearing. Wow. I fought the good fight of faith. I was thinking this and I shared that at the earlier service. You know, are you ready to meet the Lord? And if you get there, can he look at you and say, you've done well done, my good and faithful servant? Have you been holding faith? Are you continuing in faith? Are you continuing to fight these battles by faith? Are you finishing what God's given you to do? You see, God has a destiny. He's got a purpose. He's got a, a destination for you to reach. He said, I fought the good fight of faith. I finished the race. I've kept the faith. Now there's a crown of righteousness laid up for me. I was thinking this earlier today that, you know, I heard it this morning when I woke up. There were people that were on a plane going on vacation somewhere, I think to the, the Hamptons or whatever it be, and the plane went down and four or five, did you hear about that this morning? Four or five of them died. They're all dead. Let me tell you what, they didn't wake up this morning thinking that they were going to enter eternity. They woke up this morning with, in mind going on vacation and something happened. Now listen, I know we walk in the protection of, of angels and walk with God and he protects us, but you, you never know. You could, you, could, you could be on your way to go shopping and you end up in eternity. You could be on your way to vacation and end up in eternity. You could be on your way to work and end up in eternity. And, he, and, 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 and I don't know, you know where these people ended up, but, but when I get before the Lord, do I want to get there prepared? Do I want him to look to me and say, well done, thou good and faithful servant? Or is he going to look at me and say, you were a quitter. You didn't continue. You didn't keep it up. See, that's what, that's what the Holy Spirit is really speaking to us. That we got to keep it up. You got to keep it up. You got to keep on doing it. You can't back up, quit. You've got to continue. Everybody say continue. continue. Fight the good fight of faith. Hold fast your position. Don't quit. Don't give up. Don't back off. Keep it up. So what are we to do? We're to fight the good fight of faith. Continue. Continue. This is a good one. I got to take a few minutes on this. What are we to continue in? We're to continue fighting the devil. Don't back off. Take your position. Take your authority. Don't let the devil get away with it. Put your foot down. Say, you're not welcome in this house. There's no rebellion that resides in this house. My kids are not going to be rebellious. I take authority over rebellion. I take authority over sickness. I take authority over disease. I take authority over these things in the spirit. I bind them at the source. See, the problem is that a lot of us, we're fighting in the flesh when we ought to be fighting in the spirit. You can't fight spiritual battles in the flesh. You got to fight them in the spirit. You got to fight them with faith. You got to fight them with the word. You got to fight. You got you to come against the enemy. You've got to fight the enemy. Continue fighting the devil. Beat him back with everything you've got. Beat him back with the word of God. Beat him back with the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Wield that sword of the spirit and force him to back off of your stuff, back off of your home, back off of your marriage, back off of your kids, back off of your health. You must continue. You must continue in the things that you have learned. Some of us have forgotten. We're letting the devil get away with bloody murder because you've forgotten. Amen. Right. You've forgotten. Amen. Right. So what are we to continue in? We're to continue fighting the devil. I told this story years ago. I had the great fortune of meeting up with Lester Sumrall. Yeah. Now, for those of you who don't know who Lester Sumrall is, he was a Pentecostal preacher. And at the time I met him, he was an aged man. He was already in his late 70s, about 78, 79 years old, almost 80. And I was just a young preacher. I was in my 30s. And we had him to the church a couple of times. And then I went out to his ministry to visit him. And so on one of the occasions that I had, you know, talked to him, I said to him, Brother Sumrall, if there were one thing as an older preacher of the gospel and your years of experience, if there were one thing that you would say to a young preacher like me, what would you say? Now I'm getting prepared because I thought he was going to give me this dissertation and and, he, and you have to understand Lester Summerall. He was, he was a tough old bird. Man, he had this grovelly kind of voice and he was only about my height. And he was a little bit, 
he was rotund, but he was, he was kind of round. But he, and he took, I mean, he would say things I and mean, he didn't care. I mean, I thank God, I want that anointing. I want more of that anointing. He would just say stuff. And he looked, I'll never forget it. He looked at me in my face and he took his little bony finger and he said, fight the devil. And I thought, whoa, that's all you're going to say to me? But I realized when he spoke those words, how deeply they sat in my heart. Because really, that is the crux of the whole message, man. Fight the devil with everything you've got. Beat him back. You must continue. Give him a headache with the word of God. Give him a headache with praise and worship. Give him a headache. You see, because, all right, let, let's give you some verses. I got to go quickly here. I don't know how all this time has, has gone away. But first Peter says this, and Peter writes, he says, first uh, Peter chapter five, verse eight and 10. He says, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking he who may devour. Resist him, steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by the brotherhood in the world. You think that the devil has a new trick? The devil's using the same old dirty, nasty tricks that he's been using for thousands of years. And it says that the brotherhood around the world is experiencing. See, you're not. See, this is where the enemy wants to get you. Oh, poor me. Why am I going through this? Why is this happening to me? Shut up! Because the minute... You know, the minute this is happening to you, at the same time, this is happening to people all over the world because the devil's unleashed. He doesn't have anything new. He's doing the same old stupid things over and over and over again. But sometimes we're stupid enough to believe it like, oh, I'm so afflicted. Oh, I'm so. No, he says it's the same dirty, filthy tricks that he's been using all these years all over the world to the brothers and sisters all over the world. And his word to you is resist him. In other words, fight the devil with everything you've got. Don't become weary from fighting the devil. You must continue to wage a warfare against the enemy. If you don't, he's going to wage one against you. You must wage a warfare against the devil. You need to continue fighting him with everything you've got. As soon as he starts kicking up that dust. That's the time for you not to put your head in the sand, not to turn around and discontinue. That's the time for me to pick it up. That's the time for me to say, I see your paw prints. In the name of Jesus, I bind you, curse you, rebuke you, and push you back. Come on. You know, listen carefully to the modern preachers the younger modern preachers that are preaching today, you'll not hear one sound of the name of the devil. They pretend as if the devil doesn't exist and that is the trick that he is trying to unleash against Christianity today, that he doesn't exist, that hell is not real, that the enemy and his cohorts are not real. Because if he can get you thinking that he's not real and the way that happens is we just don't talk about him in church. We don't want to freak anybody out. Well, good news this morning. I'm here to freak you out. I'm here to freak you out. Because the devil is real. The devil is alive. The devil has a plan against you. He's trying to thwart, stop the very plans of God for your life. He's trying to get involved in your life trying to lull you off to sleep with some sort of sleeping potion. There are too many sleeping Christians. It's time for you to arise, to awaken, to get up off your backside and to get into fighting position and fight the devil with everything you've got. Fight the devil with everything you've got. Hurl an attack against him. Stand up in your home and speak. For me and my house, we're going to serve God. In this house, it's going to be a holy house, a clean house, a righteous house. We serve God. We put up the banner over our house, and that banner is Jesus Christ as Lord over this house. That's what we're doing. We got to fight the devil. You must continue. Too many weary soldiers. Too many, too many weary soldiers. Now, now listen. He says, again, be sober. It's time for sobriety. It's time. In other words, wake up. Yes. Stop being intoxicated. Amen. 
And you don't need alcohol to intoxicate you. Relationships can intoxicate you. Things in this world, worldly things can intoxicate you. Here, you can be intoxicated by a very comfortable life sometimes. It's so comfortable that I don't think about anything outside my little, my little world. And the devil will, will, will inoculate you with this sleeping potion and you little by little slip away from your sharpness. And before, before long, you're accepting things instead of standing against them. You're letting things happen instead of stopping them in the spirit by taking authority over these things and cursing the enemy and pushing him back. He said, resist him. Resist him being steadfast in the faith. In other words, continue on with what you've learned. Don't back up. This is not the time to discontinue. This is the time to continue pushing through. Resist him with everything you've got. We have got to continue fighting the devil. There's all kinds of things that happen. Let me tell you what. Behind every messy situation, every, behind every ugly situation, there's always the devil or one of his cohorts that are the purpose the reason for that messy situation. You got to go to the source. Look, let me, let me read. Let me read. Let, let me read. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord. See, it's time to get strong, church. I said, it's time to get strong, church. I'm believing for a stronger church. We have a strong church, but I'm believing for strong believers who are going to stand together shoulder to shoulder and fight the warfare that God's called us to fight. You see, we get so inward that we forget that we're supposed to be outward. We get so hung up on the inside because the enemy uses all kinds of things to distract us from the more important work, which is the work of saving souls for the king, drawing men into the kingdom, getting people to serve, to know Jesus Christ. But we become so inward and the devil uses all kinds of tricks and schemes to get us so, dis, you know, so uh, uh, distracted by things within the church with each other and, blah, 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 and all this garbage that goes. It's all crap. What we need to do is to get our focus back on fighting the devil. Cursing him off of people's lives. Getting back down to prayer and praying those prayers that come and emanate from the Spirit in the Holy Spirit. Contending for men's souls. That's what we ought to be doing. But we play church. And we allow these things to get us all, all squirrely in our brain that we forget. We're to fight the devil, man. I'm, I'm cursing, rebuking the devil every day of my life. Kicking the devil out of this church. Cursing him. You have no right in this house. Don't you mess with God's people. Don't you mess with God's, you know, anointed men and women in this house. You have no place. Don't, 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 don't start sticking here because you're, you're not welcome in this house. What are we to continue in fighting the devil? Don't discontinue, man. You've got to sharpen your sword. You better get your sword sharpened and you better get back in the battle and you better start pushing him back. The word of the Holy Spirit today is continue. Continue fighting the devil with everything you've got. Can I get a better amen? Now listen, listen. I got to finish. I got to finish. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles. What are the wiles? Tricks, schemes, devices of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of darkness of this age and against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. There's the source right there. That's why the Bible says, why I believe the Holy Spirit is saying, continue, because some of us have discontinued. Amen. We're not fighting the enemy. Amen. We're just like going along with life, letting life just deal whatever life deals with, deals us. It's time for us to get up and start dealing a blow back to the enemy. Deal a blow back to his devices. Push him back, push him out. So, well, this, this fighting stuff is getting me tired. Wake up! Get tough. Hallelujah. Toughen up. That's right. Thank you, Tony. Toughen up. Put on your big boy pants or your big girl dress. 
So oh, this stuff is so tiring. I don't That's why you get nowhere, you mealy mouth thing. I told you I don't care anymore. I'm going to preach it and preach it tough and preach it right. We got to grow. We got to get to a new level. We got to get to a place. We got to get to a dimension in God. We're not going to get there just saying nice things to one another. We got to speak the truth because the truth will set you free. You got to fight the devil. Continue. Everybody say continue. Pick up from where you left off and continue. Don't stop. Keep it up. Keep it up. Fight the devil with everything you've got. Therefore, take up verse uh, 13, the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. Having done all to stand, stand therefore. Is everybody with me? All right. Let me give my last point and then we're out of here. What do we continue in? Be immovable, unshakable and firmly planted. First Corinthians chapter 15 uh, verse 57 and 58, this is what Paul says. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. How many of you are thanking God for the victory? You may be going through a battle, but you've got to start thanking God for the victory. And he says, verse 58, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain. God sees everything you do. God has a plan to reward and to bless you for all of your efforts. He says, he says, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding, always abounding, always abounding, always abounding in the work of God. In other words, what does it mean to abound? It means to grow. Always abounding in the work of the Lord. That's what we're supposed to be doing. Some of you got to get to work. Uh-oh, here we go. People are already starting to leave. Getting too hot for some, I guess. Abounding. We ought to be developing, growing. Go out and get the world saved. Go talk to somebody about Jesus. Go share the love of God with somebody. Give your testimony. Not just the monies. Give them the testimonies. Too many Christians have got the monies going on. Man, start talking about the things that God has done in your life. Be immovable, unshakable, firmly planted. I'm not, listen, I'm not backing off from anything. You can't get me to back away from anything that God has brought into my life or blessed me with or positioned me with. I'm not giving up my position. I'm not giving up my place. I'm not giving up my blessings. I refuse. Second Timothy chapter two and verse three and five. This is what Paul um, Paul says to Timothy, you must therefore endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. What are we to do? Endure warfare. In other words, be immovable. Say it with me. Immovable, unshakable, and firmly planted. This is, see, see, too many, there are too many wishy-washy Christians. Can I just be, can I be, you may leave the church. I may never see you again. It was nice knowing you. I was happy that you were here for the time you were here, but I got to be truthful, man. If you want help, I want to give you help. Too many wishy-washy Christians. Not committed, up and down, half-hearted, not really doing the word of God. Yeah, just, just you know, you're, you're, you're a mess. Spiritually speaking, you're a mess. It's time to get yourself back in right position. Get yourself stabilized. Become unshakable, become immovable, become firmly planted in the things of God, the word of God, and do not deviate it for one second of your life. You must, everybody say it with me, continue. You're not going to get anywhere by discontinuing. So what does he say? You must endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No one engaged in warfare. Now, if you're serious about your walk with God, you understand you are engaged in a warfare. No one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life. The silly, petty, unimportant things of this life. It's time for us to, to, to look at petty things and say, petty, petty. Forget it. I rise above it. Silly, silly. I rise above it. 
Am I speaking to anybody here? No one engaged in warfare. If you're going to fight and win a serious warfare, then you're going to have to put on your big boy pants. You're going to have to rise above all the clatter and all the distractions and all the stupid stuff that goes on in this earth and in this world and rise up to a higher level and get yourself fitted, immovable, unshakable, and firmly planted. That's what God is calling us to do, to continue in this. So he says, no one, in, uh, no one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of life that he may please him who enlisted him. Can I give you one more verse? I know I'm preaching long today, but it's okay. It's okay. I got to give you this. I got to give you this. All right. So listen, listen, go to 2 Corinthians and I want you to open to this with me. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Now listen, this is what Paul says. Hallelujah. We must continue. Everybody say continue. continue. This is what Paul says. Chapter 4, verse 8. He said, we are hard pressed on every side, yet not crushed. In other words, the pressure's coming, but it ain't going to crush me. Not going to break me. Pressure's going to come, but it's not going to break me. It's not going to break you. Pressure's going to come, but it's not going to have a harmful effect upon my life. We are hard pressed on every side, yet not crushed. We are perplexed. We may be a little confused. We may not understand everything, but we are not depressed about it. Hallelujah. We are hard pressed in every side, yet not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but we're, we may be getting persecution, but we know that we are not forsaken by God. God is with me and for me and on my side. God will never leave me nor forsake me. He says, persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. I may have been, you may have gotten a couple of shots in. You may have got me in the face a couple of times, but I picked myself up and I dust myself off and I am not hurt by it. I'm going to move on. Listen, listen, along the way, sometimes people are going to strike you down and he's it, going to have the tendency to want to hurt your heart. You got to say, you might have struck me down, but you're, I'm, not, I'm, I, li, 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 I'm not destroyed over it. I'm not going to be destroyed if you don't love me. I'm not going to be destroyed if you leave me. I'm not going to be destroyed if you want to go your way and do something else. You don't want to be in this marriage anymore. You go ahead. I don't care. Whatever it be, I may be struck down, but I'm not going to be destroyed. You may have disappointed me, but I'm not going to be destroyed by it. Ooh, Glory. He says, always carrying about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our body. For we who live are always delivered to death for Jesus' sake, that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our mortal flesh. Verse 13. And since we have the same spirit of faith, according to what is written, I believed and therefore I spoke. We also believe and there, you better start speaking what you believe. But first, you better get your believing right. You better get your believing lined up with the word of God and then start speaking what you believe. So he says, knowing that Jesus who, uh, who raised up the Lord, knowing he who raised Jesus, Lord Jesus, will also raise us up with Jesus and will present us with you. And then let's go down to verse 16. Therefore, we do not lose heart even though our outward man is perishing, that means it's decaying, as much as we try, we primp, we prop, we do all kinds of things, but the outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. For our light affliction. See, that's the problem. Some of you looking at your affliction like, oh man, this is the worst thing in the world. All right, you got to start looking. It doesn't matter. It's a light affliction. For this light affliction, which is but for a moment, in other words, it's not here to stay, it's passing in the moment of time. I mean, I mean not, not in, the, in the scope of eternity, this is just one moment of time. You may be going through a difficult cir circumstance or a difficult cir situation, but when you look at it in, in, in eternity, in the scope of eternity, this is just one little blip on the screen. He said, this light affliction, which is but for a moment, but for a moment, but for a moment, it's going to pass. It's going to get better. You're not going to stay here forever. It's going to change. Something is going to turn. Something is going to, something good is about to happen. You're not going to be in this darkness. You're not going to be in this confusion. You're not going to be in this place much longer. This light affliction is just but for a moment. Is working a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. There's something great and good that's about to happen. I may have to go through some things. But there's something good on the other side of this. And then verse 18, he says, While we do not look 
at the things which are seen. While we do not look at the things which are seen. While we do not look at the things which are seen. While we do not look at the things which are seen. That's the problem. A lot of people have discontinued because you're looking at the things that are seen. You're more impressed and you're more you know, distracted by the things that you see. And the word of the Lord is, we do not look at the things which are seen, but we look at the things which are not seen. That's what, that's in the, in the eternal heavens where we don't see the spiritual side. God is working. Listen to what he says. For we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. What are we supposed to be looking at? We're supposed to be looking at God. We're supposed to be looking at the word. We're supposed to be looking beyond the struggles and the trials. This may be here, but it's temporary. It's just momentary. It's going to pass. I know it looks like it's never going to end. But you know, you know, you know, you know how you can make it end quickly, quickly or more quickly. Start getting into faith. Start declaring that this battle's over. Start declaring that there, it's a new day. It's a new beginning. Oh, dear God, I hope you got something out of this. I don't know. I'm trying to, trying to preach, preach my head off. Glory.